I am joined by Congresswoman Yvette Harrell of New Mexico's second congressional district. She is a new member of Congress, having just been sworn in not too long ago. And we're going to talk about a wide swath of issues. But Congresswoman, thank you so much for speaking with me and taking time out of your schedule to, to interface with me. I'm happy to be here. I, I always appreciate these opportunities. So thank you. Yes. Why don't we first start with what is New Mexico's second congressional district? For those unfamiliar with it because in my initial research you have a lot of really cool uh, nature stuff going on you have a lot of interesting historic cities so talk about your district first yes the district is incredible i mean the people are as diverse as the uh, geographic climate it is all the way from the arizona border to the texas border and virtually about half the state so on the east side we have obviously our oil and gas production. On the west side, you know, we have 180 miles of uh, border with the Mexico border. And in between, we have just really great rural communities dotted all over the place. A lot of history, obviously in New Mexico, it's one of the largest districts in the country that's not an individual state. Um, so it makes it really interesting. We have a lot of agricultural operations there. We have National Forest, home of Holloman Air Force Base, and then a couple of things people don't know is there are actually two of the world wonders in the district, White Sands uh, National Monument and also Carlsbad uh, Caverns. So very diverse landscape. Um, certainly, I love, love New Mexico and I was born and raised in the district. What prompted you to run for Congress? Because for any political observer, we saw that you ran before against the husband that you toppled and then you had a rematch with her and then won. But what was kind of your driving force and, and why did you anticipate that you could pull the race off in 2020? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, so I served in the New Mexico State Legislature for eight years. Um, and what got me into serving in the first place was, and this is not unique um, to myself, I don't think, but after 9-11, it really started mattering to me who was making decisions on all levels of government. And so I obviously got really more engaged in our local party and worked on some campaigns and some federal campaigns. And, and like many others, I grew up in a Christian home, but uh, after 9-11, it made me get, get really better established in my church life, which I did. Um, and so after serving on the state level, you know, I, I've said this a lot, it really matters who's making the decisions for all of us. And really it's more of a, it's a heart of serving the responsibility of understanding that every vote you cast, you know, in New Mexico, I knew it would affect everybody in the state, whether they were in my district or not. And likewise, you know, in, in Washington, the votes cast affect everybody in the nation. So it's very humbling and it's a very overwhelming um, responsibility when you think about it in those terms. And for me, it is about always people over politics. And, you know, I ran on a uh, pro-God, pro-life, pro-gun, pro-family, pro-business platform. That's who I am as a person. Those are, you know, the, the that that's the areas where I'm just very grounded. And um, and I think just have served on the state level. People really knew who I was. Um, obviously, the rural issues very close to my heart. So just bringing all of that experience um, and those values to Washington. Yes, and the 117th Congress has certainly gone off to an interesting start. But I think right. what people fail to underscore a little bit is that actually it's a very interesting class of new Republican members, yourself included. You're the first Cherokee woman. I believe you're also the first Republican native uh, representative. Uh, and there's a lot of other people who have very interesting backgrounds and interesting yes. characteristics. And uh, that often doesn't get underscored in a, a historic number of women who on the oh, yes. and, and you're part of that. So could you speak a little bit to that? And how you think that could shape the future of the Republican Party, and if we want to, if you, if Republicans at large, excuse me, want to see more of that coming in, and, and do you think people will be inspired to run for office, seeing kind of the successes so far? Sure. I mean, and you're right. This this freshman class is probably one of the biggest, obviously, and the most diverse. But the it is so incredible to be with such an amazing group, and not only just the freshmen, but then to serve side by side with people that you've known or had friends, you know, had relationships with in terms of friendships or colleagues, and then people you just hold in such high esteem, you know, the Jim Jordans, the Debbie Lescos, the Andy Biggs, um, the, the freshman class, what a great class of people. And what's really great is coming 
from all over the country with all different life experiences, different business backgrounds. Some are military, uh, some have, are retired law enforcement, business owners, a grandmother, you know, small business owner. It just, it's such a refreshing uh, face, I think, of the nation. And th again, just different backgrounds, different experience levels. And I believe we all came in the same, with the same mindset of just a passion for serving and for uh, working for the people of America because we obviously love this nation and want to do our, our part in preserving our prosperity and, and the growth of our nation. Since beginning your tenure, you were placed on the House Natural Resources Committee, which is now chaired by Congressman Westerman as ranking member. He's a sportsman and I've talked to him before and he's a very interesting guy and it's, and, uh, it's a very interesting uh, Republican conglomerate, I would say, coming into the committee. And you also were um, placed on, is it the oversight committee as well? Yes. So yes. What those experiences have been and what you hope to bring to the table, especially in the natural resources side. Yes, natural resources obviously was the committee that I really wanted to get on because really that committee encapsulates most of the district where we have tribal land, public land, private land, where we have agricultural operations, we have forest issues, we have endangered species, water rights, land rights. I mean, just all of that really is encompassed in the district. So natural resources was of course, just a perfect fit for me in representing the district. And then of course, on the oversight, I come from a real estate background and a small business background. So one of the, the real estate industry as a whole is very heavily regulated. And to be sitting on a committee where we can really take a hard look at some of the regulatory uh, issues that come through, again, looking at the executive orders and, and understanding the constitutionality of these and how we can work through those to help the American worker, the American business owner. So very, very proud of our committee assignments and look forward to working with Congressman Westerman um, and his experience, what he brings to the table, learning from obviously everybody on the committee, but doing our best for state of New Mexico, but for the nation. And what issues are you going to primarily focus on? What do you think Republicans writ large are going to advance in the committee this session? Are you guys going to push back some of the extremist measures coming from Chairman Grijalva and his party? Are you going to try to work with them on some issues? Uh, what do you anticipate this legislative session? I really anticipate initially uh, these executive orders. I mean, clearly when you ban leasing permits on public lands in a state like New Mexico, where 60% of our natural gas comes off of public lands, over 50% of our oil production comes from public lands. This is a direct hit to our state's budget, to our education system, because these are the resources that we, we put into the teacher salaries, into the classrooms. And so I, you know, this, this has changed a little bit because like you mentioned, you know, all of the above, you know, the endangered species, uh, uh, the uh, waters of the U.S., those types of things. But now that we've seen these executive orders being signed, you know, this is going to impact not only New Mexico, but other energy producing states and workers from all over the country, you know, the Keystone Pipeline. So I personally feel like there will be um, discussions about the executive orders at the forefront and then move from there. But this energy, uh, it's crippling in terms of what the executive orders are doing to public lands and the permitting and so forth. So I believe that will be something that's front and center on, on both natural resources to some degree and even on oversight, to be honest with you. Do you worry that the public lands management model, which is traditionally balanced use, is going to shift to public use? And I say that because your fellow New Mexican, um, Deb Halland, who is likely to become the Interior Secretary, and obviously House members, for those watching or listening, don't decide on cabinet member nominations, but I wanted right. to perspective because I think some of her secretarial orders that are expected and so far what have been coming down the pipeline, the executive order to put a moratorium on leases, also national monument reviews, other issues like that. Do you worry that the balanced use practices of public lands, which allow people to recreate, but also to put off of those lands, is that going to be in jeopardy? And, and um, do you worry that uh, your colleague from New Mexico who has pushed forth a Green New Deal, has kind of pushed these preservationist policies, will kind of go against the interests of your home state. Um, what are your concerns with her selection and do you, do you think she can be swayable? Well, the, and these are great questions and this is one of the reasons why I signed on to Congressman Pfluger's bill, even before the executive orders, even before we knew with certainty that she would probably get that appointment for Interior. And the bill basically says, uh, in terms of oil and gas operations on public lands that we are protecting them from moratoriums from the Department of Interior and others. And, you know, we have been very, um, very vocal about, look, these, these public lands are the bread and the bread and butter of our state's economy in terms of our oil and gas industry. But 
we, there is always concern about government overreach and land, the taking of uh, public lands in the state of New Mexico and other states that have uh, large quantities of public land. And we've seen it in New Mexico with the desert peaks, um, wilderness area. I mean, that takes our farming and ranching community off the table in terms of access to grazing. So yes, this has been an ongoing problem we've seen over the years. We want to protect our land and what we want is public access where everybody can enjoy the land, but we don't cut off our ag industries from the ability to, to graze cattle on these public lands. And we have the wilderness study areas, again, more unique um, to the Western states that we, I think, should be taking a look at. That's a priority for me and the Natural Resources Committee um, because we establish large swaths of land as wilderness study areas. They never get turned into a wilderness area, but yet we're not uh, allowed to have our cattle grazing on those properties while they're under study. So a lot of things, but yeah, I hope that we can work with this um, uh, Secretary of Interior when she does get the nod, because again, it's about protecting our assets, but it's also about doing things in the right way and, and based on conservative efforts, um, conservation efforts, and working with our industries that rely on public lands. Um, so this will be a challenge, but I'm hoping that we can work with the Interior. I hope she understands and I believe she does see the need for collaboration on ensuring we keep our industries alive. Yeah, that, that's a pretty optimistic look. Hopefully in her new she may maybe shed some of her uh, progressive inklings on that because she has to represent a wide swath of interests. Uh, but she's also um, touted in Congress, and I believe one of Biden's secretarial orders included 3030. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's to kind of section off 30% uh, of waters and lands. And kind of yeah. what you're looking to, those proposals could be seen as good faith efforts, but a lot of sportsmen and women, hunters and anglers have uh, had complaints about it because it actually could take them out of the equation for decision, for input, um, because hunters and anglers tend to be the largest contributors to conservation funding. So do you worry, and have you heard from New Mexican hunters and anglers that they may be pushed out of the discussion, uh, discussions that may be had over management and oversight of public lands, um, not simply, like I said, to uh, have it for, for revenue purposes or for livelihoods, but just simply for access. Uh, but, but has yeah. it arised in the Republican caucus for the Natural Resources Committee yet? We haven't had any conversations specific to that, but I'm very familiar with what you're referring to. And again, you know, and people don't realize, and I'm glad you mentioned that, our outfitters, our wranglers that make a living on people coming in, hunting, you know, fishing on these public lands. And when, what we're doing is incrementally, we're seeing more and more of our public land taken off the table. So it prohibits, you know, any kind of conservation efforts in our, in our forest. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to go to New Mexico or any of the Western land uh, states and see the condition of the forest. The forest management has been terrible. It is not if it will burn down, but when, because we've had such a poor job, seeing a poor job of forest management of the undergrowth. You know, we're averaging five, 600 trees per acre instead of really 40 to 45 trees. And it's sucking up our uh, water. I mean, we have the aquifers and we have a water base that obviously in ground water and we're losing a lot of that because of the overgrowth, but it's just the access, it's the livelihoods. It's the ability to, to enjoy and use these lands for a number of um, uh, resources, whether it's real, you know, extractive resources, timber, those types of things, or recreational or job related. So yeah, these are, these are big concerns and the 30 by 30, I've heard about it and we have got to stand up and protect our public lands clearly from more government taking. I think the overreach, and this has been my wheelhouse for years, even as a state rep, to protect our public lands. And in fact, I introduced legislation as a state rep to transfer the public lands in New Mexico. And I know others did it in the Western states to either the counties that encapsulate those national forests or in some areas, the state, but so that we could manage, open up our tax base, put private sector back to work in terms of um, logging and not, not clear cutting, but actually health management of our forests. So these are gonna be, I believe, ongoing conversations but we've got to be smart about what kind of effort to take place and protect private property rights in the water, our private property rights in New Mexico. Again, protecting uh, water, especially in a state like New Mexico that's very arid. So yeah, you just, you know, we could go on and on about some of these issues and they're going to be um, front and center, I believe, for at least the next two years. You were talking about forest management. Do you think, despite having President Biden in the president, uh, in the executive branch, excuse me, and Democrats leading much of the legislative chamber, 
Uh, do you think forest management could be tackled or is it going to be politicized largely to focus on climate change um, and less so much on forest management? Because I think increasing numbers of studies show it has, it's, it's not that it doesn't have any impact, but it's, it's more so the lack of management. Um, a little bit of climate change does play into it, but it's more so negligence that comes with uh, no forest management. Yeah, it's 100 percent. It's been politicized for a very long time, you know, not just in the last several months, but even beyond. And it is it is absolutely uh, a situation that needs to be addressed because, again, and this is what's interesting to me, environmentalists don't want to see us in any real uh, change in terms of conservation, you know, where we should be going in and taking out the underbrush, we should be protecting our aquifers, our, our base water, so forth. But yet, when we see these thousands and hundreds of thousands of acres on fire, and they, you know, what is that doing to the environment, you know, in terms of smog and emissions into the land? Look at the, the, um, the um, wildlife that we lose. I mean, it, it's almost doesn't make sense. How, how would we not be more proactive in wanting a really healthy, robust forest conservation or management opportunity instead of watching them burn down? So we've got to have a better sense of what's really at stake here. But again, it becomes so politicized um, and it becomes very much a line in the sand. And then you compound that with the NEPA studies, you know, the, the, um, you know, the Endangered Species Act. You know, we've seen, in fact, our entire timber industry it was shut down because of the spotted owl. Well, that was in the 70s. There's been no, no real effort to um, expose good habitat for the owl. They don't even live in our forest really anymore because there's so much overgrowth and I mean undergrowth in the forest floor, they can't even hunt there. So it's just, it's kind of an oxymoron. We're doing one thing we say, but really the reality is nothing's happening and we're actually, in my opinion, hurting those that live in and around the forest, those who uh, live in and around to make a living on the forest. And, you know, we've got to come to a better uh, way of doing things because it is politicized and that's what's hurt everybody. Do any of your Democrat colleagues have any concerns about Biden's executive orders on oil and gas leases? As part of the transition, you know, you have no choice but to go to solar technician jobs. That's what we saw climate envoy John Kerry say. And some people will say, well, traditional in energy sectors still have relevance, but others will tussle with it and say, well, it's time to move away from that. It's not working because we said so. So how, how are your constituents grappling with those comments? Are they receptive to it or are they saying, step back, this is actually not something we have to do. We don't have to take such drastic measures. We could still obviously refine and do our jobs. Right, instead of it being based on science and things that matter. Well, this is great. Let me unpack that a little bit. Number one, um, so far in our delegation, I'm the only one who has stood out very boldly, very loudly about the impacts this will have on our state's economy. And not just the state's economy, it's the jobs, it's the communities, it's the service providers, 117,000 jobs related or uh, indirectly or directly to the industry in my district. Um, that's number one, and we've got to be thoughtful of that. Number two, we sent a letter to our uh, governor, our Democratic governor, Michelle Grisham Lujan, asking her to stand with us to, to strengthen our uh, stand against this um, executive order. So far, we've had no response from her. And here's the deal. Everybody, I think, in the industry in terms of oil and gas, they have done the right thing. We saw production levels at their highest um, just in the last 18 months, and yet emissions at their lowest. So we know industry leaders with science, technology, innovation are doing more with less and a much, much smaller footprint than before. But to think that we can throw out an entire industry, and here's what's really crazy, and I say this all the time, and probably your viewers know this, it is not just about starting the car in the morning. It's about the, uh, the um, number of products, byproducts of petroleum, you know, whether it's plastics, batteries, gloves, the ventilators, the masks, you know, it's the medical equipment, it's the technology and the, the equipment and the products that we use day to day to day. Nobody's talking about that. And so this is a, a rough idea to even think that we would be smart to get rid of an entire industry, all in the name of go green. And let's face it, the green in industry is not going to um, backfill 170,000 jobs. It's not going to backfill the lost revenue we're gonna see in the state of New Mexico. I think that most people are open to all of the above approach but we cannot do this with a knee-jerk reaction and think we're saving the universe, saving the world with a new green deal, when we're going to really comp uh, compound the problems that we're gonna create throughout our nation. And this is another thing that no one talks about. I mean, I'm sure that your viewers do. In New Mexico, in the country, 
here, you know, we have all this production and we are heavily regulated in the oil and gas industry. Now we're going to be reliant on, on production oil and gas out of foreign countries that do not have those environmental reforms. It's dirtier. I mean, we have the most effective, efficient, and most affordable energy in the country. And we're going to throw all that out in the name of save the environment, but yet get production or oil from Russia who doesn't have the reforms. It doesn't make sense. And again, the double standard is what I think is very frustrating to the American worker, the American business owner. And we're seeing it not just as it relates to oil and gas production, but in a number of er other areas. I and mean, we, we don't even have time to go into all those, but you know, it's okay for one person to do it. I'll, I will cite one example. They're talking about keeping these fences around the capital complex. Hmm. Really? So why don't we finish the wall on the Southern border? You know, so fencing works in capital, you know, in DC, but not on the Southern border and other borders where we're trying to protect our national security, our communities, our farmers, ranchers, families that live in and on the border. It's just kind of a double standard here. And I think that's when you pull the layers back, it's that the crux of the double standard is what I think is really becoming such a frustrating measure for a lot of people on a many, many different topics. Yeah. And that's why um, when I spoke to ranking member Westerman, he said that he really wants to see and champion kind of a market conservation uh, perspective. And I, I think the rest of the caucus plans to do that too. And it, it's very encouraging to see that to kind of not really be at the sidelines, but to offer what a conser conservative conservationist ethos is. I don't know if we've able really to, to define it, but I, I think that's kind of the direction he wants to put the committee in, maybe the greater movement in, saying that you can have an all of the above energy approach, traditional and alternative, without sacrificing one or the other. And I think the past administration actually, much to their credit, they actually did do that. They did balance environmental stewardship with job creation. And we're going to see kind of this move, I think, unfortunately, to preservationist environmental ethos where the environment supersedes everyone else's needs. And I think studies point to the fact that when people are unemployed and their livelihoods are in jeopardy, they don't care about the environment. So I don't know what ramifications they don't anticipate with this because we want people to care about their surroundings. But if they're out of a job, they're not going to. That's what numerous studies point to. So. Right. Democrats, sadly, I don't think understand what's going to happen. You're going to have less of an interest to, to be a steward um, when you have to worry about surviving, essentially. Right. And it, it just doesn't make sense because, you know, you're swinging the pendulum so far. And I can't wait to work with the Congressman uh, Westerman, especially with just his background in forestry and, and, and the ideas that he has to bring to the table. But it's, it's true. There is a very valid all of the above approach where everybody can work together. And again, we're, you know, our industry leaders are looking at science, technology, a development. The, you know, what we've been able to do uh, through emissions and other things, it just makes no sense to think that getting rid of the entire industry would somehow make you know, all the problems go away when in fact it's actually again you think you're creating a, a solution for one problem but you're really creating you know 15 more issues and you know why why is it that the american worker and there's so many um there are so many jobs that are indirectly related our service industries our restaurant industries you know all of the communities in my district on that east side are built around this oil and gas industry and to think about losing our, our grocery stores or our small, you know, our dry cleaners and our pharmacists and all of these uh, businesses that are there because of the industry, feeding the industry, not mentioned real estate markets, land values, etc. I mean, the, the ripple effect, you know, the compounding uh, problem that this is going to make for a state like New Mexico, it, and it's not just New Mexico, it's going to be Texas, it's going to be, you know, North Dakota, everywhere. And so, it's not even a realistic approach to uh, to do what they're doing, especially through these executive orders. And that's why, hopefully, you know, in my mind, and I, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm hoping that we can come together as a country, as a committee, as people that are here doing the people's work and really um, have the right idea in mind in, in working together on things. I haven't seen the administration signal they have an appetite to work together since so many of these executive orders have been signed without even so much as a conversation, especially with with people, you know, with myself or others that are, um, you know, in the Western caucus um, area, especially the Western lands, because that unique challenge there. But, you know, we, we just we can do better than this in America. What other issues are also of uh, concern to you. I know we've talked a lot about natural resources, which I super appreciate, but I wanted to pick your brain on. You alluded to border security. I know you're pro-life. 
Um, you're also a small business owner. Is there anything else uh, that you want to discuss that you're going to be championing during this con congressional session? Yeah, well, right now, the big issue for us, obviously, in New Mexico is we're kind of getting hit with a double whammy right now, because obviously we have the executive order affecting the, the energy sector, but then we also have the, the executive order affecting the border issue. And so I'm very proud we, um, we introduced the PAWS Act, which actually keeps that Title 42 tool in play for right now. Um, that's a tool that the uh, Trump administration invoked. Of course, uh, public health on the border has always been a, a, a topic of conversation. But the Title 42, because we're in pandemic, has been a, it get, has given a, the Border Patrol the ability to deport any of those coming into the country illegally through either Canada or Mexico and send them back. Uh, and now they, they are able to do so because we're in pandemic. So we go under the assumption that everybody has either been exposed to, may have COVID or any other infectious, infectious disease. And between October 2020 and December 2020, because of Title 42, the Border Patrol was able to uh, deport over 180,000 people. This bill simply says, this is a public health issue. We want to ensure that the Title 42 process is still made available to our Border Patrol agents so that we can protect our rural communities, our healthcare workers, our Border Patrol agents. Um, it would actually stay in effect until three criteria are met, and that's until this uh, national, the federal health orders are lifted. So we get back to normal, our kids in school, our businesses are open, the economies are open back up. And until CDC uh, changes the travel ban from level four, which it is now from Mexico and Canada to level one. And this for New Mexico is huge because we've, we've suffered greatly as a result of COVID. Our governor has had us on lockdown, mask wearing, our kids are not in school. We've lost a lot of businesses and we've lost a lot of employees. This simply says, Let's not have done and made all that sacrifice for nothing if we're going to open the border and allow those to come in and not, not so much as even being tested. And then put that responsibility on not only uh, communities in New Mexico, but around the nation. Um, so we're hopeful that that will get some traction because, again, that is simply a public health issue. And um, coming from a state like New Mexico, where we are not open like our neighboring states are, you know, Texas and Arizona are, are obviously more open than New Mexico. So that's huge priority for us. But in New Mexico, people want ac access to the vaccine. They want to open their economies. They want to open them safely. And we want to get our kids back in school. We've had a record number of teen suicides in the state of New Mexico. Um, and we just, we can't allow that to continue to happen. And so those, those are just such pressing issues. And hopefully we can work both on a state, federal, and local level to ensure that we can get our schools open, get our economy open, and get people back to work. Do you want to speak to the life issue? Because I know you're, you're passionate about Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, like I said, when I, I think I said at the beginning, you know, pro-God, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment. Um, for me, life starts at conception. I'm very proud of, always have stood for uh, life. And in fact, as a state rep, introduced several pieces of legislation uh, banning the 20-week ban on abortion. And of course, in D.C., I've already signed on to I think 10 or 12 pieces of legislation, um, the Baby Born Alive Act, the parental notification, others that are just so vital to be that voice. And I, I said when I ran, I, I'm going to take my Christian values, my pro-life values to Washington, D.C. and very much uh, uh, happy to support life. And this last week, you know, there were a lot of the pro-life virtual rallies and so forth. And so it's um, you know, it's, it's time that we stand up and really have that voice. And I hope we don't lose that momentum we have with the past administration now, but certainly it's a priority. And um, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, they're tapping their watch because I'm running a little late on time. So. Yeah, no worries. Um, work, we didn't cover the gig issue, but maybe we can revisit that sometime soon. And, and I'll follow up. That, but that's something to keep on your radar, um, especially as a lot of young people and probably a lot of your constituents do that. But briefly, where can my listeners and followers uh, follow your musings, keep track of the bills you're putting forth and watch your work in the House Natural Resources Committee? Okay, the best way to do it is everything's happening live on our, um, on our website and it's herald.house.gov. So it's H-E-R-R-E-L-L dot house dot gov. And of course, all of our tweets are there real time, our press releases, our, any of our news clips or um, interviews that we do. And that really is a great place to find information about what we're doing. And people can sign up then to receive our emails and get on a, 
a, a mailing list. And so that's that's the best way to do it. And of course, we've been uh, trying to keep everybody involved and in the loop on what we're doing here in Washington, D.C. And so that's a great place for people to start. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Congresswoman Harrell. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope we can, uh, once the COVID pandemic kind of subsides, I would love to interface with you uh, in person sometime. Maybe we could do a follow-up interview. Thank you for your time. I would look forward to it. So thank you so much.